Good evening, church. We welcome you back to uh, Faith at Five. Thanks for being part of the worship this evening. Just a few announcements. Uh, quarterly business meeting will take place after this service this evening, so stay and uh, help us. Again, decisions that need to be made with that. Uh, Operation Christmas Child is well underway. We thank you, everybody, who's already participating about that. Uh, Miss Sandy says there have been many who are sponsoring a box, or you can pick up your boxes and fill your own boxes, but we appreciate your help with that. Faith Bible Institute, they're starting up really quick. They're going to be starting up August the 19th, and there's information about the classes and what they'll be studying this semester. And uh, you uh, talk to Miss Janie Howard if you have questions about that. Her number's there on the, on the announcement list. And then uh, also ask you to mark your calendar for Sunday, August the 18th, Faith Family Swim Night at the Cabot Aquatic Park. That's going to be from 6.30 to 8.30, and that will be an evening that we kick off Awana and the new school year, and this will replace our normal evening service. So you come, and you can fellowship there that evening. Just on our prayer list, please remember, our campers, I haven't heard from our campers, so we say that's good. And uh, so they are at camp, and they'll be there uh, this evening through Wednesday. They'll be coming home Wednesday evening, so you remember them this week and all the sponsors there. Uh, Mr. Mason Cooper, please continue to uh, remember Mason. Mason is recovering from uh, a very long ear surgery, 14 hours. That surgery was last Wednesday, and it was outpatient. He w went to a hotel after that surgery. And and so please uh, remember him. Uh, he's been very tired. There's been some swelling. Uh, they said that he's feeling better today, and we're thankful for that, that he's been out. He's been out walking, and uh, he'll have a, uh, an appointment with the, uh, the doctor this week. And then a week from Monday, they will do a reveal and uh, what they have done so far. So uh, you just continue to remember Mason and his family. The Gober family, please continue to remember them. Miss Valley was sick this this morning. Uh, the twins are doing okay. Said Eli's had some problems with reflux and they've got him a medication for that. So please uh, continue to lift up the Gobers. Uh, Brother BC. Brother BC is in the hospital. He's at St. Vincent's More North in room 417. Please remember him. Uh, he dehydrated, probably a UTI, and uh, they're keeping him and uh, doing some more tests tomorrow, a swallow test. And uh, so you please. Uh, remember Brother B.C. Miss Susie Glab is uh, home recovering from back surgery this past week, and we ask you to remember her. Uh, please remember Brother Rich's brother, Michael Hamlin. He was recently diagnosed with esophageal cancer. Also his wife, Michelle. Her name is Betty. Excuse me. Excuse me. Also Michael's wife, Betty, fell and broke two low, lower vertebrae in her back and is currently in nursing care. And uh, they're in Belgium, so please remember that them. Miss Mary Sterling will have shoulder surgery this week. Brother Billy Cerati is patiently waiting to have a lipotripsy for kidney stones. It was supposed to be last week. It's now been moved to the 5th of August, and so please remember him. And then we ask you to remember Miss Diane, Diane Rose. Uh, Miss Diane has been diagnosed with a kidney cancer. She will have surgery August the 7th, and they will remove one of her kidneys. The doctors feel that they can uh, take care and get everything they need uh, to be removed during that surgery. She will have uh, immunotherapy following that, so you let her know that you are thinking about her and that you are praying for her as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and begin our worship this evening. Father God, we come to you. We thank you again for the privilege to be in your house tonight and that we can come and that we can just lift up these requests, friends, that uh, we are just know are going through uh, uh, good times and difficult times, Father. And uh, we just uh, lift up Mason and we just thank you for the, the young man that he is. And uh, we just know that uh, he is going to... Uh, continue to trust and lean on you. They said today that the smile's coming back, and so uh, we know how we, we like that smile that, that Mason has. So we continue to give him strength this week as he's healing, and we just ask you that he has a good appointment this week and this reveal the following week, and we'll just give you all the praise for that. We uh, just lift up the Gobers, continue just to uh, give them special grace and strength, and we just know that, that life is, is going very 
very quickly for them right now. So help us as a church family that we just encourage them, that we help them, that we offer a meal, that we just do what we can to make life a little bit easier for them. We lift up Brother Hudson tonight. You know his needs, and we ask you to do mighty things there. We lift up Brother Rich's brother and his, his sister-in-law. ask you just to give them the guidance, the strength they need right now. And Father, we just lift up Diane, and we just know that this has been difficult news for her to receive, but we know you have a plan, you have a purpose, and that you are going to, uh, you're going to do mighty things, and uh, I know that she is leaning and trusting on you, and she is just, again, asking for the prayers of her church family. Again, Lord, all we do here this evening, bring you honor and glory, and we'll just... Uh, Thank you again for the privilege to be here. Thank you for the privilege that we can just, uh, the offerings that we have received so far this year above the need right now, and that we just give you honor by taking care of those monies and taking care of things that need to be done here through your church. Again, Lord, bless this night. In your name we pray, amen. Sing with us. Hear the call of the kingdom. Sing with us, who you say I am. Free indeed, I'm a 
mercy has ransomed me, His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died for me. The sun sets free. Oh, it's free. You may be seated. You may be seated.
Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Miss Karen. Let's all stand together tonight. And um, we're going to look in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 28. A message I call simply wild flowers. Wild flowers. Matthew 6, 28. And why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? O oh, ye of little faith. May God bless the reading of his word tonight as my prayer. You may be seated wild flowers 
the Greek word that is translated lily in verse 28 means simply flower. Flower. And I know, you know, we think about this passage a lot of times around Easter time, but uh, I can say almost uh, without fear of contradiction that what Jesus was talking about when he talked about the lilies of the field was not those beautiful lilies that we have around Easter. Uh, it, these were indeed flowers. Uh, he would call them the flowers of the field then, which is therefore where I got the title of our message tonight. Wild flowers. Wild flowers. Now, just because they grow wild uh, does not diminish the beauty of these kinds of plants. Uh, one of the things that uh, I kind of miss about being in the Ozarks was being able to drive around and see those beautiful fields full of wildflowers. And I have to confess that I would have probably driven right past a lot of them and barely given them a notice uh, had it not been for my mother. And uh, my mother, along with her sister, uh, my Aunt Jane, were absolutely fascinated with wildflowers. I don't know why that was. After all, they grew up on a cotton farm in South Arkansas, and there's no telling how many of them things they had to cut down when they were growing up as kids. Uh, but regardless, I don't know how it all happened exactly, but over time, uh, they really got into the wildflowers. And mother could call the names of just about any wildflower that you saw. And some of them may have been botanically correct, or they may have just been a colloquial name. I don't know. Uh, but uh, she would point out uh, this one, well, that's an Indian paintbrush. This one, that's a butterfly plant. Uh, those are blue bonnets. And uh, Mama, I also will tell you, after all the statute of limitations has run out on it by now, uh, but Mama uh, seldom came to see us in Branson without a shovel in the back of her car and a bucket. And yes, it was illegal to dig up wildflowers across the right of way uh, in the state of Missouri. And I'm, it may be in the state of Arkansas. Uh, but that was one law that uh, Mom was not ever all that much concerned about. And uh, she would take those wildflowers home and plant them very carefully in her flower beds. And um, somehow or another, she made them look pretty. And yes, just a few weeks ago when we were finishing up down there, I did notice that some of those wildflowers were still growing there in her flower beds. Now, her sister Jane was far different. While mother was very meticulous about hers, uh, Aunt Jane and where she planted them and where they grew, Aunt Jane didn't care where they grew. And so they just ended up growing all over her yard, literally. Now, to the untrained observer, if you were to drive by my Aunt Jane's car, uh, Aunt Jane's house, and look, uh, you might think that somebody was just letting that place grow up. Because Aunt Jane refused to mow down a wildflower. And you know, some of them grew pretty tall. And you might look at that and say, man. But now listen to Aunt Jane. That was her flower garden. She loved it. Now, I've heard her mama have a discussion or two. I wish you could have heard it. I'd love to hear him again right now, I'll tell you. Mama, why don't you mow your yard? Hey, Jane, I'm not going to mow. No, no. Anyway, after seeing that, and I never really looked at this passage exactly the same way after being around Mom and Aunt Jane and seeing the way they were about wild flowers. Now, interpreters differ over which flower this actually is. Most of them right weigh in on the side of the red anemone, or anemone, I don't know exactly how it's pronounced, uh, but that's the picture that you see. A very beautiful red uh, flower that indeed would grow across the field. And most of them uh, believe that was the one that Jesus was talking about when he called the, or spoke of the flowers of the field because it blooms after a rain. 
in that desert country. It blooms only for one day. And it, along with the other grasses, then would be harvested and dried and used for fuel in that woodless country uh, where they would burn it to provide fuel for their ovens. So they thought that probably that red flower was the one they were talking about. But now, as beautiful as a field full of wildflowers are, Had we looked out across that field at some historical moment and been able at that moment in time to see the incredible King Solomon out there in the field in all his royal regalia, the chances are we wouldn't be noticing the flowers. And it's very possible, in fact, that we might just go busting out there, trampling on those flowers just to get to King Solomon. Maybe pick up his autograph. I mean, can you imagine what King Solomon looked like out there in the field? Jesus was in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. And he was preaching then about the issue of worry. And he brings that up in verse 31 saying, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. What great advice that was, what great teaching that was that Jesus gave us in the Sermon on the Mount. But remember, what he told us to do was to consider. You consider. Think carefully about those wild flowers. And so tonight, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to help us all think carefully about wildflowers. And the first thing we'll think about them is the glory of the wildflower because Jesus made a comparison with King Solomon's glory. And we would notice immediately that the wildflower does not have Solomon's glory. Not at all. Solomon's glory, you see, was connected to his incredible wealth. In fact, we to this day have uh, speak proverbially about the wealth of Solomon and how incredibly wealthy he was. How wealthy was it exactly? Well, the Bible says that Solomon made silver like stones in Jerusalem. One of the things that you notice when you go to Jerusalem is it is very, very rocky country. There's rocks on the hillside, rocks in the valleys, rocks on top of the mountain. Everywhere you look, there are exposed rocks. If you think it's bad in Saline County, not as bad there. You think it's bad maybe around here, not as bad as it is in Jerusalem. There's rocks Everywhere. So when the Bible says that Solomon made silver like stones in Jerusalem, he was talking about the incredible affluence that Solomon had and its incredible abundance. Everything then about Solomon and his glory would exude wealth. He had the very best that money could buy. But the wildflower had none of that. Solomon also had the glory of position or rank. After all, Solomon was the king in Israel, and he occupied that position during a time when arguably the influence of the nation of Israel was at its peak. And in fact, uh, the influence of the nation of Israel would not uh, get back to the level that it was in the days of Solomon until one that Jesus described as being greater than Solomon. (laughs) And that was he himself, of course. Uh, There was a greater than Solomon as he. And when that greater than Solomon, Solomon's greater son, Jesus himself sits on the throne of Israel, obviously it will be more influential, more powerful, a greater country than it was even in Solomon's day. Solomon then had glory that was associated with his wealth. Solomon had glory that was associated with his position or his office. Solomon lived in a palace for the most part. Uh, His glory uh, stood out because of its surroundings. Uh, But that's not so with the wildflower. It really doesn't matter where the wildflower is. Uh, Wildflower grows 
It may have been surrounded by other beautiful flowers. <laughs> it might have been surrounded by something akin to ragweed. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what its surroundings are, where it's growing at. The, the wildflower's glory is not determined by the neighborhood that it lived in. What was the glory then of the wildflower that Jesus wanted us to think about? Well, first of all, the glory of the wildflower had to do with its natural condition. It's impossible, you see, to think that this plant was putting on a wildflower face to hide its sandbur character. No. Uh, the wildflower had nothing to enhance its beauty. The wildflower did not wear makeup. It never had its hair did. Nothing. The wildflower exists in its natural condition. It had nothing that money could buy, but of course it had all the things that money can't buy. Its glory was found in its natural condition. It was uh, not an enhanced kind of glory at all. It was immune to any outside influence. Anything that anybody would do for the most part to try to improve on a wildflower is probably going to mess it up. One of the things I learned about Arkansas when I moved over just a little bit east of here was about a marvelous thing called the Grand Prairie. Now, you might think that growing up in Arkansas, I would have known all about the Grand Prairie. I did not. I grew up in South Arkansas. We knew about pine trees, hills, and a lot of swamps. That was it. And, uh, and, and I knew there was a capital city up there and mountains in the north, but I just somehow or another... Uh, I, I'm, I might have slept through that class on Arkansas history. Somehow I missed about the Grand Prairie. Some of you are looking at me kind of funny tonight. You might have missed that too. If so, let me inform you that there is an area over here that was natural prairie ground right here in our state. It, it's just not been cleared. It was that way. It was natural grassland. And it grew, of course, beautiful wild flowers I learned from the farmers over there that there was very little of that prairie ground left because it all went under the plow and once it went under the plow those natural glass, grasses and flowers were gone for good and so only a small portion of that beautiful prairie ground that was over there at one time has been preserved but hey we're thankful for all that great rice and corn and soybeans that they grow over there now grand prairie but that was once covered in wildflowers but man's efforts then to improve that country wiped out the wildflowers tells us then something about it you know it, it doesn't really need our help it, it, it'll do just fine at what God designed it to do all by itself its glory then is just in that breathtaking unspotted beauty there's no intrinsic intrinsic value about it you can't eat it you can't use it to cover a house it's kind of like our money it has no intrinsic value the only thing that made it valuable, makes our money valuable is that you think it's worth something and I think it's worth something and there may come a time where we, none of us think it's worth anything anymore. And we'll find out what we're talking about when we say that money, especially paper money, has no intrinsic value. See, the wildflowers are that way. There wasn't a market you could trade them in. What was its glory? Its glory was in its beauty nothing else but then we can also consider the testimony of the wild flower <laughs> there's nothing mystical about that wildflowers only do one thing they grow they grow they grow rapidly and they bloom Rapidly, But even though those things are true, it still grows imperceptibly. Now, you might argue about that with me a little bit with that wild flower. Some of you probably call it weed, but, and it may very well be a weed, but it is at least some kind of a flower called a dandelion. Now, I don't know how it is exactly, but I can run my lawnmower over dandelions, and by the time I get to the end of the row and look back, they've already grown back. Have y'all noticed that? That's the way it is at my house anyway. 
Um, but it uh, doesn't matter how fast it appears to us that they're growing. If you sit down and try to watch them grow, they can't, you can't see it. And wildflowers are all that way. I'm sure we could have some uh, uh, time-lapse photography that could see it. Uh, what do they do? They just grow. And all at once, they're there. We notice them, for the most part, only when they bloom. Make no mistake about it tonight. Jesus knew this and he used this example. Every one of them is a tribute to the creative hand of Almighty God. It is God who makes the wildflowers what they are. If we read on in the passage, we'll see that Jesus referred to them as being grass. Not only did he call them flowers... But they were also grass. If God so clothed the grass of the field. You see, only, only God could make a grass that blooms beautifully. He didn't have to. <laughs> he didn't. Why did he do it? He didn't tell us why. All we know is that he did. And so every one of those, exactly as Jesus calls it out here, I could almost see him smiling. After all, he was the one who made them all. <laughs> Consider those wildflowers. Let's take a look over there. You see that? Look at how God clothed the grass of the field. And according to Jesus, the grass of the field grows and blooms beautifully without any work or worry on its part. It never worries about it. It does not have any kind of conscious effort. You're not ever going to see some motivational speaker going around there trying to talk those flowers into bloom. Now, come on. We're going to have a blooming conference today. I probably shouldn't have said that. I, I meant hope y'all got it the right way. Now, now y'all need to bloom more. I tell you, we're going to have to, we, we're not blooming near as much as we did last year. We're going to have to pop this thing up a little bit. Come on, guys. Nobody ever does that with the flowers. They don't work at it. Not a bit. They never think about it. Not a time. They don't toil. They don't set goals. They just do what God made them to do. could be considered as an example of the law of indirection. Have you ever noticed that the harder you try to sleep, the harder it is to go to sleep? But if you forget about trying to go to sleep, first thing you know, you're waking up. If you're like me, it's about two o'clock in the morning, but you did go to sleep and you have woke up a little bit. Uh, happiness is not achieved by striving for it. Uh, the wild flower grows by being what it is and where it is. It is submissive to the divine decree, although it is not consciously so. It grows as God supplies its need. It does what God makes it do. Its glory then is produced by its growth. So is ours. Remember Jesus talked about bearing fruit. I'm the vine, he said. You're the branches. What does a branch do to produce fruit? It abides. It abides. It maintains a connection to the vine. That's all it does. And if it maintains that connection, then it's going to bear fruit. If it doesn't bear fruit, then the husbandman who's in charge of the vine will trim away that unfruitful branch so that the resources of the vine are not wasted. After all, no vine dresser is in business to produce pretty plants. Different kind of thing than the flowers. But it is in a way the same kind of principle because Jesus said, Herein is my Father glorified when you bear much fruit. And so there's a fruit that Jesus mentioned and then there's more fruit so that every branch that is in me that uh, produces fruit then uh, the Father will tend it so that it produces more fruit. Herein is my Father glorified in that you bear much fruit. So when we grow, 
We grow in a way that God has designed us to grow. We respond uh, to that planting and watering so that as God gives the increase, our growth may be slow and imperceptible, but people are going to notice when we bloom. And we will. And lastly then, there's the sermon. God gave the wildflower, you see, only one sermon to preach. It preaches it faithfully and well. Verse 30. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? We call that a lesson in contrasts. Uh, it is one that Jesus looks at this flower that is here one day, gone the next, and is going to be burned in the oven the next. It has a very short lifespan. It only does one thing. It grows. It looks pretty for a moment, and it passes away. And the point is, is that God is not telling us that we're like that flower. He's telling us that we are of much more value than that flower. As he would say of the sparrow, and as the great preacher Dr. R.G. Lee was famous for saying, that he said there's never a sparrow that falls to the ground, but that God himself attends the funeral. And that's, again, another thing that Jesus taught us about sparrows. And he said, though, so fear not, my little flock. He said, you're of much more value. See, it's a lesson in contrast. So here's the grass of the field that God made pretty. He didn't have to make it pretty, but he did. But then once it's done its job and it's preached his sermon about the creativity of God, then it's done. And it is thrown in the oven. And it's still useful maybe for a bit. But uh, for the most part, its lifespan is very limited. Its ability to glorify God is very limited. But that is not the case with us. But it is, of course, possible for us to get too concerned about the details of life. With what we're wearing. What we're making. What we're doing. Where we're doing it at. And not nearly concerned enough about being clothed with the glory that only God can give us. I like the fact that the lilies of the field, the flowers of the field, the wild flowers have nothing that money can buy, but they do have what money can't buy. And so tonight we can consider these flowers, wild flowers. Maybe ask ourselves the question, uh, you know, what am I wearing? Am I clothed with the glory of God? Is my life a testimony? his glory and if we could say well yeah I've been saved by his grace and I hope you can say that because that's where it all begins is to receive Christ as our savior and so if we receive Christ as our savior we can say yes my life is a testimony to the glory of God I have what only he could do I couldn't save myself I couldn't do it for myself I couldn't make it happen but God has done it for me and then we can go beyond that. But how am I doing with all these other days that God gives me, all these other opportunities to give Him praise and glory? Consider the lilies. Let's stand together, please. Heavenly Father, tonight I pray you'd take this message and this incredible passage that you placed before us for a few moments tonight and help us indeed to consider these wild flowers, the lilies, how they grow. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you'd help us also to consider, to think about how we're growing. And are we growing in our capacity to give you glory? And Holy Spirit, if there are things in our lives that we need to bring to you, you know it. Bring them to our mind so that we can get these things right and that our glorifying you would increase. Bless us now as we respond to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. I sing praises to your name. Praises to your name, oh Lord, praises 
Thank you, Brother Bill. Praise team. God bless you tonight. Uh, we're going to dismiss for five minutes and uh, for our business meeting tonight. If you're visiting with us, you want to stay for business meeting, you're welcome. Uh, but if you need to go, we understand. We'd encourage all our folks to stay. This is our semi-annual business meeting. We'll be electing our Sunday school teachers and officers tonight. Uh, it should move pretty quickly, but we do have several things to cover. So, uh, Encouraged again, five minutes, come right back in. Anything before we're dismissed? Anybody? All right, Brother Orville, would you word our prayer, please? <clears throat>